Today's podcast is brought to you by Patreon supporter Christy Largent. If you'd like to learn how you can support the podcast through a small, recurring monthly donation, log on to schooloflaughs.com forward slash P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And we also have a brand new sponsor. If you're a really funny comedian who wants more laughs, more gigs, and more money, the Clean Comedy Conference 2017 in San Diego is just for you. You'll learn from successful well-known comedians like Eddie Brill and Jimmy Brogan, as well as working comedians you may never have heard of who are making bank doing what they love. And they'll show you how you can do it too. More laughs, more gigs, and more money. The Clean Comedy Conference is October 13th through the 15th at the Comedy Palace in San Diego. It'll be jam-packed with workshops, panels, performance critiques, and plenty of networking and opportunities to perform. Registration is just under 120 bucks when you use the code School of Laughs. But this offer ends soon, so don't dilly-dally. Register now at cleancomedyconference.com and use the code School of Laughs. And you're on your way to more of everything you deserve. More laughs, more gigs, and more money. Clean Comedy Conference brought to you by Brandon Young and Maria Herman. Offer expires September 15th. Welcome to the School of Laughs podcast, brought to you by schooloflaughs.com. Whether you're an aspiring comedian, a part-time pro, or a speaker who wants to become funnier, this is the podcast for you. We'll break down tools, tips, and techniques to help you get bigger, better, and more bookable. And now, here's the show. Welcome to the podcast. Rick Roberts here. Thanks again to our sponsors for supporting the podcast. Today, I cannot wait to get into this episode. I got to interview Karen Knotts, who I met maybe a year and a half, two years ago. She is the daughter of Don Knotts, one of my comedy idols. Of course, I do a lot of work impersonating uh, Barney Fife, his top character for sure. Uh, but man, he was so talented, and those genes trickled down. He has a very funny daughter, Karen. She does stand-up. She's funny in her own right. She also has a story and a show called Tied Up in Knots, where she talks about growing up in that family and what it was like being around her dad. Very cool interview. Can't wait to get to it, so let's just get to it. How about that? I'll give you some announcements at the end of the podcast about some upcoming classes. But right now, let's get into this fun phone interview with Karen Knotts. Well, I'm on the phone today with Karen Knotts. Karen, how are you doing this morning? Doing great, Rick. Thanks. Thanks for joining me. You're in California right now, correct? I'm in Los Angeles, North Hollywood. I was looking at the timelines of of shows your dad was doing back in the days, and he was kind of bouncing back between New York City and California. But were you born in California? I was born in uh, New York City, Manhattan. We lived there. We lived in New Jersey, and my dad was working on the uh, Steve Allen show. And there was a there was a television station out there in Dumont, New Jersey. Jackie Gleason worked there, and that's where we live. We live in Dumont, New Jersey. But my dad would commute every day into Manhattan to work on the Steve Allen show. When the Andy Griffith show came along, all the shows were starting to move out to the West Coast. So we moved out to L.A. Then I was about five years old then. Just a five year old girl moving out to California. That must have been a A pretty big experience. Do you remember much about the move? I do. Yes. We even stayed in Steve Allen's house for a couple nights. (laughs) Um, And um, and we we lived next door for a while. We were out here to um, Errol Flynn. And I knew his daughter, his played with his daughter. And then we finally moved out to our permanent home, which was a beautiful home in Glendale, California. For California, that was kind of a small town feel, was it not? Yeah, it still has that same small town feel, and it also has mountains similar to where my dad is from in West Virginia. So it's sort of like he found his his second home in Glendale. Yeah, that worked out pretty well. And then early on in in like grade school, did you get into any plays or anything, or was it a little bit later that you wanted to get into that? That came later. I actually wanted to be a child actress, <laughs> yeah. but my dad said no, and he didn't feel it was a good life for a child, and he was right about that. And I'm I'm glad that he didn't let me do it because, you know, it's hard enough being a kid, just regular, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's so, amazing how many stories you see where, you know, kids were given all that attention early on and then the rest of their life, they're just trying to 
get out of jail. Basically. Get back to that. Yeah, get back, get back to what they knew as a child, and that was so unreal. Did you um, visit the lot when they were shooting very often when, in the early days? Yes, we went out there, my brother and I, and uh, it was really fun going around the set and seeing, I remember seeing, the, the first time I saw a cutout of the squad car, I was pretty much in shock. <laughs> oh, really? You know, they have a cardboard cutout of the squad car because the door, um, that they when they had moved the squad car in and out on that lot somehow conflicted with traffic coming into the studio. So, so uh, Bruce Bilson, who was the um, AD at the time, suggested that they make a car cut out of the sheriff's car so that they wouldn't have to always have the car out on the street. So they had that as well as the real car. And every year they had a new car. They got a new car every year because they were made by Ford, I believe. And, and they had a contract. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that's correct. Yeah, Ford, uh, anyway, so it was, Ford was a sponsor on the yeah. show. General Mills was the, the primary sponsor, but they had some underwriting, I think, by Ford Motors. Okay, okay. Um, and so the, when I was a child and the first time I saw that car, I was in shock. I said, is that what they drive around in? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize that was, wasn't the only one <laughs> until I saw the other. But I just remember um, walking up on the set, and it was the first time being on a set, really. And just the experience of, of seeing how weird this was to be in stores, you know, on the main street of Mayberry that you just see every week on television and then you're walking around and it's so fake. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I remember going inside and looking inside the cans, you know, in front of the little grocery store and they were empty, you know, just set dressing, you know, that to me, this was all real until I came, <laughs> until I got there. It That's kind cool. of blows your mind because then you realize, wow, these these are really actors, including my dad. You know, of course, I knew he was an actor, but you realize, God, the power of these actors to make these empty things seem so real is amazing. And then inside the buildings, I expected to walk into a real building and there was just be like big old Klieg lights or those humongous lights they had back in those days. Mm -hmm. you know, they, were like, they were like a big old, uh, you know, truck tire or something. And they were so big. <laughs> that's awesome and i'm just kind of looking at the dates and stuff you and ron howard are only separated by about a month uh mm -hmm. so when you went to the yeah. set and you saw him on on the set what was that like for you having seen him on tv before and then you see him there that was very exciting um he was completely different of course from the character he played because he was he was way more mature than any kid that age could he could be, you know, I mean, he was on, he was an, he was a working professional. He was an actor making a, you know, making a salary and with a very serious job. So he was, you know, a very different kind of kid than I'd ever seen before, but there was, he was a very nice kid. And I remember him showing me things. He had little gadgets and things and he showed them to me. One was a radio that was so small it could fit in the palm of your hand. And that in those days, uh, I'd never seen anything like that before. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so that was some pretty advanced technology he had there. That's pretty cool. And um, mm -hmm, and I remember walking around and seeing the the schoolhouse where he went to school, and and you know, yeah, we talked. You know, we were we we talked together a little bit. That's great. And I'd imagine uh, in those days, you know, the shooting schedule would go for a while. Was it was it hard to get time with your dad for a little while? Then you'd have more time when the show wasn't shooting, or was he pretty busy all the time back in those yeah, days? Yeah, he yeah he worked really long days. He was on the set sometimes. He'd be there for twelve hours, um, or ten or twelve hours. You know, so yeah, we didn't see him a lot during the week, but he would always make up the time with us when he could. You know, mm -hmm. and then in the weekends he would be in there studying a script for the next week's show. So it was pretty, pretty demanding. I can imagine. What, what were some of the favorite things you did as a child with your dad when he had some spare time? Did you guys, did you like to fish? Did you like to tell stories? What kind of fun stuff did you do? In those days, he, he, you know, he didn't, we never went camping or fishing or anything like that. But what we loved to do was we had a set of encyclopedias and he would pick a subject out of the encyclopedia and he'd say, okay, kids, what do you want to learn about? tonight and we would pick or you know we'd go through the encyclopedias and he would read out loud from the encyclopedia to us and I'll never forget that that's interesting and of course he loved to tell funny, yeah and he loved to tell funny stories he was always cracking us up all the time you know making us laugh and 
being silly. I know he uh, used to do ventriloquism back in um, the early days. Did he ever do any of that kind of stuff around the house for you guys or, or kind of play around with that stuff? No, he didn't, actually. I think he was way done with that stuff. <laughs> yeah, I heard he, I heard he threw was, the, the yeah. ventriloquist dummy overboard on a ship once and said, I'm done with that. Is that right? <laughs> there are a few different versions <laughs> of how he lost that dummy. I'm not completely sure which one is true. I have my suspicions. You do? But, um, I do. That's funny. That's funny. <laughs> but I've heard three different versions, and then I asked him finally. It started bugging me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this was like a couple of years before he passed, and I said, Dad, you know, how did you really lose that dummy? I've heard it so many different ways. And he goes, well, to tell you the truth, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> so, so by then, he probably couldn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's great. Well, that's awesome. And and you kind of, I guess in high schools when you started doing some plays, is that when you kind of thought maybe I want to do some acting on my own here? Yeah, I started, well, actually branched out in junior high school. I started doing, I got in drama class there. And then we moved to Beverly Hills. And um, the, the, um, the school drama department was kind of snobby. They were cliquish. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the drama teacher was an actor himself. And he would put, kids in the place whose parents were somebody who could help him in the business. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I was kind of shut out of that. And, um, cause my dad, you know, nobody thought of Barney Fife as being, you know, big, great cloud actor or something like, <laughs> like Beverly Hills, you know, that was a whole different thing. Um, so I had the usual struggles of any kid in high school feeling a little left out and stuff. Was there uh, any, any acting roles that, you kind of fell into in junior high or high school where you kind of felt like, all right, this is, these are my people. This is what I'm supposed to do. Yeah. Oh yeah. I knew I was supposed to do comedy. The first thing I did in junior high school, I originally thought I wanted to be a dramatic actress like Catherine Hepburn, you know, and I studied her of course. And so the first assignment that we had was to do a pantomime. It had to be of an insect. So I chose to do a cockroach because I thought it was dramatic. <laughs> so I did this whole dramatic pantomime of this poor mother cockroach struggling to find food to feed her babies. And by the time I got to the end of it, the class was in hysterics. <laughs> and they were laughing their butts off. <laughs> and I felt completely devastated. I was like, I did not get this across. <laughs> oh. <laughs> did not get the pathos, the sadness, the horror of this cockroach's life <laughs> <laughs> so it took a little while longer before it finally dawned on me that I was meant to be a comedian. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. You know, I always think great uh, comedians and comedic actors and actresses, uh, their level of commitment to a character is what makes it funny. And you were probably so committed to that cockroach that it was just un unbearable. <laughs> <not to laugh. laughs> it was. And of course, the physical characteristics that resemble my father were coming out also, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's great. Were there other, um, you said Beverly, Beverly Hills High School, so were there other students at that time that went on to do some, some TV or movies that we would recognize? Well, there were a few kids of stars, like Corbin Burnson went to that school. Oh, yeah. Although he was ahead of me. He was ahead of me. Um, and then Missy March, Mel Torme's daughter, and, and Hal March's um, stepdaughter. Uh, I'm one of those two. <laughs> Um, there were a few, you know, there were a few kids like that, and um, Joey Sutton, Frank Sutton's son, went there. But it wasn't until college that USC that I really began to flourish in the drama department, and there I was cast in, I was cast as the mother, Penny, and you can't take it with you if you know that show. Yeah. It's a classic from the 1930s that never dies. It's still being done somewhere, you know. And that was my first real breakthrough, and I felt like in in the drama and I felt like I could really do this. You know, my dad came, my dad came to see me in every play, literally every play I was in. Oh, that's sweet. He was such a devoted dad. The only time he didn't come was one time he was sick. And he'd always praise me and say how much he loved. And then he would always go backstage afterwards and just thrill everyone to pieces that he would come back and say hello to everyone, you know, the cast and my friends and stuff. It was so cool. That's great. And USC overall is a, a pretty beautiful place to go to college, isn't it? It is. It is very nice. I know a couple I of my friends. I remember there being a lot of red tape there, but 
<laughs> and signing up for classes took forever, but it was a really charming school and still is. That's great. And then um, it seems like now I met you a couple of years ago in Atlanta and just had a few minutes to talk to you. Did, it, did you spend time in Paris or something for a while? Do I have that right? Oh, yes, I did. I went to Paris when I was 17. Tell me about that. By myself. What, what took you there? <laughs> Well, I convinced my parents that, to let me go there because I wanted to learn how to speak French, and it would be very academic. <laughs> and, and there was a boarding house that I was going to stay at. And when my dad found out about the boarding house, he said it was okay. Um, it wasn't a very terribly supervised boarding house, however. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so it was a bit, you know, a, a bit um, challenging for a young girl being in Paris alone, but I managed and it was fun and it was, it was an interesting growing experience. Did you take in some plays while you were in Paris? Uh, I did actually, I did go to one play, but at the time, you know, I wasn't speaking French that well, <laughs> but it was a farce and I really enjoyed it. I, I watched, was watching the physical thing, but and in the school, you know, I was attending a school for people to learn to speak French in France, in Paris. And I couldn't learn it that way because the teaching was all in French. So you couldn't get it. French being taught by French people in French. That How does that get, you know, <laughs> that didn't work. Um, so, but I learned to speak French just by getting around, you know, talking to cab drivers, trying to get directions, all that stuff. So when my dad finally came back to pick me up, we got into a taxi cab and I... <laughs> He just was blown away because I was speaking to the cab driver. He must have thought that I was fluent in French. That's right. <laughs> well, the great. truth was I'd just taken a lot of cabs and I knew how to talk to cab drivers by then. Yeah, well, there's no better way to get into it by just immersing yourself in that culture. I, I'd imagine the food over there was pretty good while you were visiting as well, huh? I got to be an expert on chocolate ice cream at the outdoor cafes. I got cafes every day. I was there <laughs> for my chocolate ice cream and biscuit. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Yeah, I've never had the chance to go over there, but I, I can imagine, especially as a teenager, it just would seem not only like a whole new country, but a whole new world and, and tons of cool experiences. So how, how long did you stay there and when did you come back? I was there for, I think, about three or four weeks it was quite a bit for, you know, a, a long stay. Yeah. About that long. So you, you come back and you finish up at USC. What were some of the, the early things you did after college? I, I saw you've been in a couple of productions and anything stand out as your favorite so far? Well, um, I, I did a lot of plays out here, a lot of small theater. And like I said, my dad came to see me in all the shows I was in. And then he actually gave me an opportunity to be in plays with him. My dad did uh, when I was in my 30s. I went out to perform with him in several places in uh, Cherry County Playhouse in Michigan and uh, La Mirada Civic Theater out here in California and um, Kansas City, Kansas. Those were three of the places. And that was a real different experience from doing small theater out here because it was like real theater people really paying real money and, you know, and sitting in nice, beautiful theaters and everything union and all that stuff. It was such a difference. And my father would um, really take control. Like we would rehearse in Los Angeles usually. And then, you know, everything would be all nice. And then we'd, we'd leave, we'd go out on location. The director would still be in Los Angeles. And my father would proceed to redirect <laughs> some of the things and re-coach, you know, start coaching people and that he thought needed. And then he would also have to, in a way, act like a producer because when you get out to a theater, you know, you've got to make sure that you have the lights and the sound and all of that working. And sometimes they're taken care of the way they should be and sometimes they're not. Right. So he would some have to get on, on the case of people and make sure that they paper the house. You know, they don't want to paper the house because that's, money and tickets they've got to give away but that's really important and the sound had to work that was the main thing he, he was always harping on was sound because if they can't hear you they're not going to laugh yeah and those are things that seem obvious to people listening maybe but you've been in enough theaters on your own uh, comedy clubs if the sound and lights aren't right that there's nothing the comedian can do you know or the actor or the actress so did the right we're we, we as entertainers are, you know, really at the mercy of 
of the venue to do the, the things that they're supposed to do. Yes. Yeah, so and when you go out and do your, um, your play tied up in knots, which I haven't got to see yet. And I just looked at the dates and, um, I'm not able to see you this fall, but I'm, I'm going to keep watching. Hopefully I get to see it in the spring. Um, is It's a one woman show, but do you take anybody along with you to help you with all the, the light sound and that kind of thing? No, Rick, I've been doing it all on my own. Fortunately though, I've been able to figure out ways to make it very easy. Uh, since I am just one person, um, I don't have a lot of needs. I have all of my props. Most of my props are hats. So I take a, a hat rack with me, a, port- a small portable one. And, um, and then I have a few other small props and, um, I have my, my show is all on my laptop cause it's all, I have images constantly on stage while I'm on, I'm performing and about 102. And then I have, a, I have some videos of my dad as well and me. And so, um, I have to have a tech rehearsal before the show to make sure that's all working right and all that kind of thing. So it's not terrible for me. Uh, but I am, you know, I am very dependent on them, on them to get, which I, I haven't really had any problems so far. Only one time when I was performing in a club that was supposed to be kind of a theater club, but they, they didn't have it set up right for, for the uh, projected images. That was the only time I've really had a problem. The show that you've been doing, uh, I'm sure it's evolved a little bit over the years, but what was the, when was the first year that you put on the Tied Up in Knots program? The first year was at Mayberry Days, and I've been going back there ever since because uh, they were so good to me out there. And I'm going back again this year, of course, and I'm going to do two shows. I have a Tied Up and Not show, and I also do my um, a keynote sort of more of a more of an informal talk where I just talk about my dad and um, and focus pretty much on the Andy Griffith show, where it's Tied Up and Not encompasses his whole life. So they're very different. Gotcha. And um, so I'll be doing both of those shows this year out there. And what is that like for you? <laughs> I can only imagine going to Mayberry Days. Everybody probably wants to grab a picture with you and talk to you. It, can it be a little overwhelming at times? Well, it was when I first went there the first couple of years. Um, but now they're pretty much used to me. It's like there are a lot of celebrities out there who go there and everyone wants to see. And I'm just I'm just one of the people that, are, you know, the people enjoy seeing. So it's not like crazy like that. But the first year I, I, I was feeling a little overwhelmed by, it. yeah, because I was the new new kid on the block out there. <laughs> yeah. Are there some cast members you really enjoy seeing uh, when you go out to those? those types yes, of- I really do. I really enjoy seeing everyone. It's like everybody's become good old hometown friend, you know, and it's, it's become familiar and, and fun, you know, it's, I really enjoy it. And for people who haven't been to a Mayberry Days, can you kind of just give us the rundown generally of, of what sure. what that weekend looks like? Sure. Well, there's there are certain events that that go on every year. They have a golf uh, tournament on Thursdays, and then they have a country club event and a show after that. And then the Tams play across the street. The Tams is a wonderful uh, sort of rock group from the '70s, and then my deputy's daughter show and then the dillards are playing the dillards play there every year they're of course they're in the, the bluegrass hall of fame mm-hmm. you know they're from the the darlings from the andy griffith show and ronnie show is has a show and michael hoover and leroy mack is there and the malpass brothers i really enjoy them too james gregory the funniest man in america the vw boys and uh and there's my tied up and not show and Professor Browning, and then Colonel Tim. So it's a very full schedule. And people like to dress up as the characters, uh, walk around. You have your Aunt Bees, your Gomers, your Goobers walking around. (laughs) (laughs) You know, people get silly. They have pie-eating contests, and they have trivia contests, and all kinds of stuff. And then there's the museum, uh, which has a lot of the stuff from the show, and some of my dad's own personal stuff is there, too. The gathering of the people, like you say, they've all got – a similar mindset that they they kind of wish the old days, the good old days were still here. So you don't have a lot of the stress and the politics of everything going on today. And it's kind of just like a little island Absolutely. unto itself, right? That is so true. And you know what? It's also very contemporary. I know people are afraid of losing their small town identity, their cultural identity, because of things moving so fast. But last night, I was watching the movie The Lovings. 
if you have not heard about that, it's about the first interracial black and white couple who became legally a, a married couple because of the Supreme Court decision. Mm-hmm. It's a brand new film that just came out. It's a very hot film. And I was watching the movie last night and they show the couple sitting there on the couch and they're trying to stress out from all this horrible stuff they're going through. And they're watching the Andy Griffith show. Oh, that is great. I'm not kidding. They're sitting on the couch watching the Andy Griffith show. It's the pickle story, the Aunt B pickle story. Oh, it's pickle, thank you, Cumbers. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And they let it run for a while. And I thought, golly, this show is so relevant. It's never lost its relevancy, and that's why people are still watching it. Yeah, it's pretty amazing, the the fact that it's still on all the time, that there's not any episodes that you don't think could actually still happen today in a small town. And, right. You know, I was reading, you know, even though it was shot uh, in the 60s, it, it kind of had a 30s and 40s feel to it, even though they never really said that. And it's people. You are so right. I mean, that's what my dad used to say, and Andy said that, too. Yeah, I always thought that was great, you know, because people will sometimes, since I do some impersonating, will will grill me with questions about the show, so I have to kind of read up on it a little bit. But they always, when I tell them it was shot in the 60s, they can't believe it. They're like, no, it was shot earlier than that. I'm like, no, it was on TV in the 60s. They're like, oh, it seemed like it was the 40s or 50s. I'm like, well, they just didn't timestamp anything. They just went to, to basic relationships between good people, and that's what people kind of identify with. True. And you know something, in the in a small rural-ish town like Mayberry was, um, they didn't progress as fast, you know, as they did in the cities. So that could very well have been a town like that, you know, where they just didn't bother to keep up with the modern trends of the big city, you know? You know, every once in a while I play a town just like that doing stand-up. <laughs> where you're like, <laughs> hey, you guys have heard about the newspaper, right? You got you to gotta read that once in a while. <laughs> Well, you know, I want to bring up another point, if you don't mind, about the small towns. Sure. Um, Small towns in America are still the backbone and the heart of this country, even now, even today, with all the technology and the fancy stuff going on. And I'll tell you why I say that. It's because when I do my show, when I travel around the country and do my show, I usually will perform in a small city or a small town. And I've gotten, I've seen so many of these small towns. And it is fascinating to me to see how many great and wonderful small towns and cities we have in this country. It's like a treasure of, of just incredible community out there. Um, but the, the problem is that people don't know, they don't know how much is out there. It's, it's, it's not a lot of connectivity sometimes. Um, but what, what I find is when I go to a, um, a town, a small city town, I find it very common that people will leave the town to go to a big city and get an education or get started in a big job and, and make their way and success in the world and raise a family and get that money and all that. And, and, and then they find themselves yearning once again for the town they grew up in. And so then they think about coming back and they do. That's what they do. They come back to that town. And so then they're living in two places. They're living in, you know, in the city and the town. And then they will very often become an influence in that town. So what they're doing is they're keeping the town alive by coming back to it, and then they're making the town stronger by bringing some influence to the town. They're influencing the town in ways that can make that town even more unique and better. Uh, I find that a lot of places. No, Have I you agree. found that to be true? I agree yeah. 100%. And, you know, it was about, well, when Clinton was in office, he had this Main Street initiative that he gave all kinds of government grants to, you know, Main Street USA and small towns. And that was one of my favorite things that he did because along Mm -hmm. with that, there were grants for the small theaters that kind of had gotten shut down or overrun or left behind. And a lot of those theaters were updated and are really the gem of of the small town where everything happens there throughout the year and it becomes a real focus point for connecting the community. And, uh, right. And right. That's absolutely true. Yeah, and what you said about the the influence coming back with the knowledge you learned in the big city, and taking the best of that and and kind of plowing it into your small town to make sure that they don't get left behind completely. I see that all the time. And yeah, uh, all right. Yeah, it's it's a good thing, oh, and wow. it's it's interesting too now that the um, just the way you know I live in Nashville, so forever Nashville had its thing going on, and then people moved out into the county and further out and. 
and now the 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 money that's going into downtown Nashville and the people that are moving there because they're building condos, there's even a chance for bigger cities to have that small town connectivity again with more people living oh. there. That's great. That's wonderful. Yeah. So you, you never lose it, that small town feel. If you grew up one, I always wonder about people who only grew up in a, in a big city and never had the positive, you know, right. just the positive right. memories of growing up in a smaller community. I, I kind of feel bad for them. Um, and maybe those people seek out that later on in life. But yeah, I grew up in a really small town in Kentucky. Uh, we we had a McDonald's when I was in high school. We finally got one. So that's how small it was. You know? <laughs> and wow, I, so you really do relate to a small town. Oh, yeah. I mean, just the, the parades down Main Street and, you know, standing up on the courthouse mm-hmm. steps trying to have my pea shooter. Remember pea shooters? Little straws. Yes, I do. <laughs> We would stand up on the courthouse steps and try to shoot. Well, the you team. didn't want to be on the wrong end of a pea shooter. That's the thing. <laughs> no, and unfortunately, a few tuba players were when I was in high school. I, I would stand up there and try to launch the peas right into the tuba. <laughs> <But> that, <laughs> oh, well, at least you were doing something uh, unique. Yeah, um, you know, and it, it would ping <laughs> off of there, you know, and uh, make a little noise. So that's that's the kind of trouble you get into in a small town. It's, that's pretty harmless, you know. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Um, well, I will say one thing to our friends listening, and in, in, uh, you said that we you have some other countries mm-hmm. um, going. I wanted to mention something about my dad um, that that many people I've talked to learn to speak English by watching Three's Company. <laughs> oh, really? Uh, yes, in other countries and or other languages. And it, native speakers of other languages learn to speak English by watching the Three's Company either here or abroad. I thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah, and I guess we didn't talk about that show very much. What were your memories of, of your dad when he's working on that show? You were you were older at the time, and, and he was too, but mm-hmm. was it as fun as it looked like for him? He was having a blast. He loved it. He really loved it. Um, he, you know, it was a challenge for him for two reasons. One, his eyesight was starting to bother him, mm-hmm. and he couldn't learn his lines like he used to. He had, need to have help. he had to have help with that. And the other was that um, he had never done a show live um, on on camera at the same time with a live audience uh. regularly. Um, and so he had to learn to get over his jitters about that. And they didn't have a teleprompter on that show. A lot of people don't know that. There was no teleprompter. And uh, so he had to really know his lines. And then you had to, you know, you were being filmed or taped in front of a live audience at the same time. Yeah, you know, I actually wasn't uh, allowed to watch that show when I was growing up. It seemed, I guess my parents thought it was a little too racy, uh, the, whole, uh-huh. <laughs> the whole scenario. <laughs> but I watched it a lot later on. And and I, I didn't realize how great of an actor John Ritter was until yeah. Sling Blade came out. And he had that role in Sling Blade. And I was just blown away by how good he was. Yeah, yeah, I know. That was great. Well, um, you know, John Ritter um, was a great physical comedian as well. But and so he and my dad were had that in common. And they were just great friends. They were both brilliant comedians. And um, yeah, they they had a very great time working together. That's great. The um, when you do your one woman show. I'm, I'm curious. Can you give us a little a little walk through the show without giving away too much of the details just so people that are thinking about coming out get a better idea of, of, of what kind of stories you tell and some of the characters you go into? Well, um, I talk about his childhood, and, and which was very poignant. And then I do a character, which was his aunt, who was his favorite aunt. And I sing a little bit there. And it's all about how he, you know, my father... Um, wanted to get into show business from the time he was born pretty much. And he finally figured out a way and he, he sent away for this thing in a magazine called the Ventrilo. And this was supposed to make you throw your voice. And he got the thing back and the device was a fake, but there was a booklet with it and it had instructions on how to, how to throw your voice into a dummy. And he studied that and he learned to do that. And because he did that, he got in, he, he made a living as a young boy I mean from 13 on he was earning money performing and then when he went into the army 
he got into the entertainment, the special services, because he knew ventriloquism so well. He was a seasoned performer. And that's what I talk about, those things. And then how he went into New, went to New York and, and how he struggled, but he got successful in New York and, and he got in a soap opera and then he got, and this was live television days. And it was, it was very scary to do live television, but he, he excelled at that. He got on the Steve Allen show and I talk about all that. And then he came out to California and then with a family. And then I start talking about the family and the Andy Griffith show and all of that and how I went on the set and all those things and in more humorous terms. I mean, I told you some of the stuff that I don't necessarily go into in the show because I don't have time to go into so much detail, mm-hmm. but it, it's, it's very entertaining. And then about how my dad was shy. So we'd go to restaurants a lot because then people would see him and they would come over to him and he didn't have to have the pain of going over their table because he was so shy. But all the people that would be attracted to him and come over to our table and, you know, Carol Channing and uh, Marilyn Monroe and, and all these famous people got to, you know, were thrilled by him and, and then, and all that. And then um, on to Beverly Hills and what that was like for me growing up in that fishbowl world of Beverly Hills and, and just, um, all my dad's life and our relationship. And it's, it's very funny. It's a funny show, even though, you know, um, you know, there's some pathos in it too, but my dad's life was all about humor. All I talked about was humor. All I thought about was humor. So I said, this has got to be a funny show. Right. It wouldn't be a proper tribute to him if it wasn't. Yeah, I think it's a great show. And in times like this where people want to go back to that simpler time, you know, revisiting yeah. what your dad did for a, you know, an evening would be a great way to do that. I, I guess I should ask you really quickly about those those Disney days because as a young kid, your dad was under a contract with Disney. Were there some perks involved with the theme parks or any any memories of those days? You know, my brother actually went more on the sets with Tim Conway than I did. Um, but he did, he had a blast working with Tim because Tim was an ad libber and he wrote a lot of scripts. He actually wrote the prize fighter that they both did together. Um, and he worked and he did some of the writing on the apple dumpling games. I'm not quite sure how many of those, but when my dad was working with Tim, he was forced out of his, because my dad was very crafted. He studied and he rehearsed and he worked so hard. But with Tim, Tim was always throwing lines in and that kind of knocked him off his game. So he had to learn to adjust to Tim. And I think he, he did beautifully. My dad always adapted really well to new things. And, um, and they drove together. They were very close friends. And, um, and and my dad said Tim was the funniest guy he knew. <laughs> yeah, well, the, the, that movie, The Apple Dumpling Gang, and the one, the second one, Rides Again, I guess. Man, when I was a kid, those just crushed me. I, the, you know, Disney used to have the Sunday night um, feature movie when I grew up, and when they played that, uh, the whole family was just rolling on the floor. Just those two together, you know. Well, they're both actors that make any other actor around them much better. But when you pair them up like that, it's just it's just a force of nature. That's right. And the funniest thing is, Rick, is my dad became straight man to Tim Conway, right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> arguably, arguably the funniest guy on the planet is now straight man to another comedian. It's just amazing. Well, that just shows his versatility and his and his willingness to play a role and, and step out of who he mm-hmm. is and, and all that. So um, I'm curious, yeah. as you're out there and you meet people, does everybody want to do an impression of your dad for you or, or have you had some awkward moments or some sweet moments where people have done the impression? Um, no, they've not done it for me, but I always, I'm always told that so-and-so does your dad. Is that right? <laughs> That's what I get the most. Yeah. <laughs> but I am frequently told that you do my dad. That's something that I get a lot. <laughs> yeah. But we've got a lot of uh, similar friends. I've got sure. a lot of friends, Rick, a lot of friends. Well, that's great. I mean, I'm sure it's fantastic and I can't wait to see it. Yeah. And, and one last thing I wanted to talk about, just because they were a sponsor on the podcast for a couple of months, uh, you were just part of that clean comedy challenge. Could you just give me your feedback on how that was? And, and, you know, is it worth the investment in time for the comedians that are listening and thinking about going to that? The clean comedy challenge is fantastic. Okay. I've done it. <clears throat> I did the one in LA last year and I just did Chicago. Leslie Norris Townsend started that a few years ago and she's done an amazing job of putting together um, a community of teachers, comedians who teach, comedians who perform and mentor, and uh, a structure that's very sound 
and a relationship between the comedians that's supportive. And it's a heck of a lot of fun. I highly recommend both of those. <clears throat> that's great. And you have multiple chances to perform and workshops throughout the day to tighten up your material? Yes, you do. You have feedback from everybody. You have <clears throat> the competitions. You get feedback. You get class uh, classroom participation. You get lectures. You get um, you get it. We had a chance to work in improv in Chicago because of Dave Sinker, who's who's a legend with Second City. We working in his club, and yeah, it's it's just a real, real growing experience. That's great. Well, I've always heard good things about it, but I thought it'd be good for the people listening to to hear it from somebody else since they're they're a sponsor. I wanted to have an unbiased opinion. So I'm glad that everything I've heard <laughs> about it is uh, is true. And mm-hmm. well, it's really great catching up with you and uh, finding out more about your show. Yeah. You're on my radar for uh, some somebody to go see when I can do it. And uh, I'll definitely share your dates with that, all my listeners anytime I see something pop up. That's really cool. I'm going to link to all of your information on the show notes here on the on the podcast uh the website is karennotts.com and you can see the schedule on there pull up some some pictures from the live show i enjoyed checking those out and find out a little bit more about karen is there anything else you'd like uh, our listeners to know about you or any, any of the shows you're doing or a way for them to connect other than your website yes i'm also writing a book and it's going to be like the, this about my dad, but it's going to be the, it's going to be very different from the show because it's going to have a lot more interview material from people that I've talked to and gotten to know and found out things. And there will be some some things from my show in there, that, but but in a very different way. It'll be more in detail and stuff. And then I also am doing stand up comedy too. And um, I have another little show I'm doing with a sketch group called Flashback and Funny Forward, and it's about. Um, it, uh, the vaudeville days and that kind of thing. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Karen, for joining us today on the School Last Podcast. Good luck with all your shows out there and, and keep doing what you're doing. Thanks for having me. It's been a blast. Well, I hope you enjoyed that interview with Karen Knotts. As you can tell, she's a funny gal and uh, had a lot of respect for her father and the way he went about doing things. And she's very funny in her own right, does her own thing, and of course has the show tied up in knots. I gave you some dates there in the episode. Uh, She just added a new date in Studio City, California at Vitello's. That's October 11th from 8 to 10. That's a Wednesday night. Vitello's in Studio City, October 11th. 8 to 10 p.m. I have all of her show dates linked in the show notes at schooloflast.com. You just click on this episode, scroll down, and make sure you click through and sign up, get tickets, go out and support Karen on her tour as she does the Tied Up in Not show. Very fun. And again, man, I was so excited to talk to her and learn a few things about Don Knotts, one of my comedy idols that you know I didn't know before and learned a few things in that episode. Very, very cool. Well, hey, if you're here in the Nashville area, I've got some upcoming class dates for you and then a couple of other things to announce in just a second. Uh, First, I want to announce that the performance class is the next coming up. It's going to be October 11th, 18th, and 25th, and those are all Wednesday nights from 6 to 8 p.m. right here in Nashville. On October 28th, that's a Saturday, that Saturday afternoon between 1 and 4 p.m., I'm running the Business of Comedy class, which uh, I only do a couple of times a year. It's very intensive. You'll walk out of there with a 50-plus page workbook of how to get your comedy career going, how to explore comedy niches where you can find riches. You know what I'm talking about, colleges or cruise ships or church shows or corporate events. Those are all niches outside the comedy club market where you can make some serious coin if you have the goods, and we talk about how to do that. We talk about booking agents. I actually tell you about most of the agents here in the Southeast and how to get in with them, as well as some others across the Midwest. We go into merchandising, marketing, self-promotion. I give you all the tools you'll need for writing up contracts, all those kinds of things, pre-event questionnaires, everything you need to get your career rolling in stand-up comedy. And we talk money. We talk actual dollar figures, what you can expect to make at different types of gigs and at different points in your career. So you can evaluate if this is something you want to invest your time into. Stand-up is definitely a long play. It's not a short-term moneymaker. You have to develop your skill, talent, promotion, marketing skills, all of that. And that's what that class is all about on October 28th from 1 to 4 p.m. here in Nashville. Also, the next writing class will follow again in November. That's the 7th, the 14th, and the 21st. 
and looking at the calendar, those are all Tuesday nights. That'll be from 6 to 8 p.m. in Nashville. Don't forget our good friends at cleancomedyconference.com. That conference coming up October 12th through the 15th in beautiful San Diego, California. This is a great conference for any comic who is wanting to get better at performing clean. We can all be funny. Can we be clean and funny? That's where the challenge is, but that's where the money is, folks. Trust me, I would not be doing what I am today if I wasn't able to work clean. So check it out. They've got great panelists, speakers, comedians that are going to help you out. Uh, Maria Herman, Brandon Young, Tony Calabri, Charlene May, Jeff Hodge, Mark Christopher Lawrence, Francis DeLorenzo, Trenton Davis, Eric Street, Jimmy Brogan, and Eddie Brill. Come on, guys. That is a killer lineup of people that are going to help you get better at being funny and clean at the same time. Go to cleancomedyconference.com. Use the coupon code School of Laughs, all one word, to get 20% off at registration. Do it today, guys. All right, real quickly, let's get an iTunes review in here. This review is from August 20th, 2017, from A. Maddie B. Comedy class in your car or living room, five stars. Fantastic introduction to comedy with interviews with veteran comedians who offer tips for mining your own creativity and learning the business of comedy. I wish I had started listening early. So happy to have discovered it now. Hey, thank you very much for that iTunes review. Remember, if you listen to the podcast and you haven't supported us in any other way, an iTunes review is a simple and easy way to show your gratitude and to help us uh, be noticed in the iTunes rankings to a certain degree. So log on to your iTunes. Next time you're on your laptop or desktop, it's easiest that way. Click through to School of Last Podcast, and you'll see right there where you can add a review. I super appreciate that, and it kind of keeps me going, keeps me fired up. It's my little paycheck that comes in, those little iTunes reviews. All right, lastly, I wanted to extend an invitation to everybody to check out the online comedy class. I've got students in 14 countries currently that uh, are in the online class. I'm enjoying teaching those folks. I also have podcast listeners now in 32 countries, which is just mind-boggling. I haven't connected with all of them yet, but just uh, interesting to see people in Switzerland, Philippines now downloading the podcast, which is great. It keeps me fired up as well. And we have a lot of good interviews on the horizon that I've already recorded. I'm not going to tell you about them just yet, but lots of good things in the remainder of the year. So online course, you can find more information about that at schooloflaughs.com. And I guess the last thing I want to let you know is I'm going to be redesigning the School of Laughs website pretty soon to make it a little more user-friendly, especially for mobile. So if you have any suggestions, I've got a window of time now in the next couple of weeks where I can take some suggestions, take a look at those, and see if I can implement those on the podcast website. Uh, Just let me know. I'm on a WordPress site, so if you know some specific things, some WordPress plugins I could be utilizing, definitely let me know so I can make it worth your while. That's going to do it for this episode of the School of Last podcast, and I guess I should do a little Barney Fife at the end just to uh, give you a flavor of what I do. So uh, I'm going to read that last iTunes review as Barney Fife. Let's do it that way. That's a fantastic introduction to comedy with interviews from veteran comedians. They offer tips for mining your own creativity and learning the business of comedy. I wish I'd started listening earlier. So happy to have discovered it now. All right, that's going to be it. Nothing to see here. Move along. Nip it. Nip it in the bud. You're still listening, aren't you? (laughs) Gonna get up, go across the street, get me an ice cream cone. (laughs) Yep, I'm gonna get up, go across the street, get me an ice cream cone. That's what I'm gonna do. Yep, I'm gonna do that right there. All right, see you guys. Have a, have a good one. Thanks for listening to the School of Laughs podcast. If you'd like to hear more School of Laughs podcasts, you can find them on iTunes and Stitcher.com. And don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. For information on upcoming live and online classes, visit schooloflaughs.com. Until next time, stay tuned, stay focused, and stay funny.